Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at a topic that's extremely important and very timely. That's urban warfare. My guest is an expert on this topic. Professor Anthony King is chair of war studies at the University of Warwick in the UK. He recently authored a book, Urban Warfare in the 21st Century. Professor King, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's jump right into this. Why did you decide to write this book? Well, I've been doing some work on the military for, I mean, uh, nearly two decades. Um, and there were two, my two previous books before the Urban Warfare book, um, the theme of urban warfare began to emerge. So I wrote a book in 2013 on infantry tactics and uh, US and British soldiers and Canadian soldiers were uh, operating in in Afghanistan, of course, US and British soldiers were operating in Iraq. And uh, the urban dimension of that campaign uh, was becoming very influential on infantry tactics. And then I wrote a book on um, command, uh, command in the army at the divisional level. And once again, the issue of urban operations, the urbanization of military operations was also beginning to be of deep concern to military commanders. So really it was a response to military professionals, their own concerns and a changed operating environment. Uh, and in response to that, as a sociologist, I thought I should be studying and trying to analyze uh, what professional soldiers, what combatants think is important. Mm -hmm. Now, very briefly, how far back did you go in history to look at these uh, the various types of urban warfare and how has urban warfare changed over not decades, but centuries, I assume? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, the focus is definitely on the 21st century, as you'd imagine, with a book of that title. Uh, but actually, I went back to antiquity. Uh, I mean, the first evidence of urban warfare is about 8,000 8, 8, BC, 8,000 BCE, whichever you, term you prefer. Um, if you look at the uh, city of Jericho that started to be built about 8,000 BC, um, it has very thick walls. And indeed, there's a couple of other settlements at that time uh, in antiquity or even pre-antiquity, um, uh, Shatelhayuk in Turkey, which show evidence of warfare and they might be urbanized defensive settlements. So uh, what we're talking about is that uh, humans have been living in cities for about 12,000 years, 10,000 years, and they've been fighting in them uh, since that time. And certainly, my focus was on the last 20, 25 years. But what I tried to do is refract that history into contemporary warfare. And what, what I'd say is that in many ways, nothing has changed. Some of the tactics that you see uh, soldiers using today, um, using shields, using battering rams to get into buildings um, are ancient in their origins. But what I would say is that each historic era has a particular kind of pattern, uh, a paradigm, an anatomy of urban warfare. And the, the anatomy of 21st century warfare, although there's definite continuities back to antiquity to the 20th century, it's distinct. it has a distinctive anatomy. Uh, and that's what interested me uh, in trying to study it. Now, in the 21st century, are there various distinctions in the various types of urban warfare. And of course, lately, if we just use current events, if you will, or recent history, we see fierce battles, well, fierce, fierce battle going on in Kyiv, Ukraine right now. Baghdad was under siege not too many years ago. Aleppo, Syria, Grozny. Are, those, are there certain characteristics or classifications that are applicable to each of those? Are there differences? Uh, distinctions amongst those those types of urban warfare areas? Well, for sure. I mean, this is the key area and the key area that I try to focus on. And what you would say, of course, is every single urban battle is unique, is a unique concatenation of various factors. But I would argue very strongly um, there is a a common pattern across all those examples you've given, Sada City, Fallujah, Aleppo, uh, the upcoming Battle of Kyiv. Um, and what I suggest is, is that um, what we see is um, as a result of three basic factors, the size of cities, 
the weaponry uh, that uh, military forces have and the actual size of, uh, of armed forces themselves has given rise to a very distinctive pattern, which has it, you know, in each case is, is unique, but has a common thread. And the common thread I would suggest is what we see is um, the re-emergence of slow attritional siege warfare, where because cities are very large, because combatants are generally very small in comparison, but they have uh, very lethal weaponry, um, urban warfare coalesces and congregates into a series of uh, intense attritional sieges inside the city. And, uh, and I've I've used a phrase to describe this. I mean, it's not a very, uh, it's a little bit of a cumbersome phrase, but I would say what we see in, across all these examples, whether it's interstate warfare or civil war, is the emergence of something I would call an inner urban micro siege. In other words, an attritional fight for key locations in the city. And that I think um, some of the tactics are definitely, uh, you know, 20th century, ancient, medieval, but that topography, I think, is quite distinctive. It certainly sounds as though it is. When, when you talk about this micro siege, is this something that uh, can be dealt with by the by the combatants in this area? I mean, obviously, it would vary from city to city and that type of thing. But are there certain conditions that exist for the people who are under siege, as opposed to the ones who are uh, attacking or trying to overtake the ones who are under siege, but are, are there certain conditions that the defenders have to exhibit in order to hold out longer or maybe to overcome the combatants? For sure, for sure. I, I, I mean, this is, the, this is the key point. So where you don't get, where siege warfare, you know, these attritional battles uh, are avoided is where the attacking force is extremely potent and where the defenders are not determined or where they are not um, uh, not organised. So, really good example of that would be Baghdad, two thousand and three. The Iraqi defenders uh, were demoralised, not very well equipped, appallingly organised. So, US troops could basically roll into the centre of Baghdad unopposed. Now, th that's actually really unusual. What typically happens is that the defenders, be they state forces or be they non-state forces, anti-regime elements, recognise the importance of holding on to urban terrain. Uh, and what they do is they they fortify positions, they create be uh, belts of booby traps, IED mines, um, and they, they struggle and fight for uh, decisive locations in their city. So the mutual action of the defenders who want to hold terrain and the attackers who need to take it uh, results in this, um, you know, sometimes really horrific attritional fighting over streets and over uh, particular buildings. This is something that still has yet to unfold in Ukraine at this point, especially in Kiev and some of the larger cities. By the time our show was on the air, the situation, I'm sure the military situation will have changed dramatically one way or the other. And it is something that's still being fought at this juncture. But as, as the resilience and the desire of the Ukrainians throughout the whole country, really, but especially in the urban areas, was this predicted or was this something that uh, we thought would not take place. I know so many people were speculating that Ukraine would fall within two days or three days, which it has not done, not even close to it. In fact, uh, some of the defenders are actually retaking some of the territory. But again, I'm not making any predictions by the time this comes on. But what what is the situation with the Ukrainians? What has led to their determination to defend their country? Well, well, I totally agree with you. I mean, the, in terms of the predictions, and certainly that was the calculus um, that Putin made, that uh, it's, it's become quite evident since the first two days uh, that he was he thought that the Ukrainian regime, the Zelensky regime would collapse and the, U, the Ukrainian armed forces would collapse with a show of force, uh, which which he tried to mount in those first couple of days. Um, but the, but the result is that he's presented with a quite different problem, and it's a problem of a of a nation that's become you know a, an intensely republican 
um, independent democratic nation with a real nationalist Republican feel. And so therefore, uh, there's intense motivation to defend territories. Now, what, what's interesting to me um, is that um, I, I, the, the, this topography of the fight doesn't surprise me. Uh, in a certain sense, in, in the book I published last year, it, it predicted that when you get uh, forces facing each other, because of the contraction of forces, they will necessarily converge and congregate on decisive locations. They haven't got, it's not the 20th century, they can't form massive fronts like the Red Army formed in the 20th century against the Wehrmacht and the SS. Um, it's not like the First World War with massive fronts. So these contracted forces necessarily converge in the theatre of operations on decisive locations. Where are they located? overwhelmingly in uh, urban areas. Now, what strikes me has happened is that, so that, that to me was a very predictable um, geometry of the campaign in Ukraine. I mean, what does surprise me, and I think surprised everyone and certainly has shocked Putin and his soldiers, is that the Ukrainians fired up by Republican nationalist fervor are actually proving not only uh, motivated fighters, but actually tactically highly capable ones. Um, and that that has been interesting, though, of course, Again, that is predictable. In the defence, the urban becomes hugely advantageous. And so if you have determined, well-equipped defenders, the ratio you can work off is about 10 to 1. You'll need about 10 to 1 soldiers uh, to, to, to seize an urban area from a determined uh, defender. So what I suggest is... Um, I, I mean, I think the, the the fact that Putin invaded, the fact that Ukraine has defended so well has surprised many people. It surprised me. But the actual topography, uh, that geometry, I think was predictable, actually. I think, and I, I'm pretty much on safe ground saying this, I think, as you mentioned, they're probably the most surprised person in the whole world as to the resiliency of the Ukrainian people and their desire to defend their country to, to retain it was Vladimir Putin, without a doubt. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows, you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at this broad issue of urban warfare, which is extremely important, and it's very timely, especially at this moment in our history. My guest is an expert on this topic, Professor Anthony King, who chairs the War Studies Department at the University of Warwick in the UK, recently authored a book titled Urban Warfare in the 21st Century. Professor King, this, uh, this whole situation you were talking about, how the defenders have basically the, the people who are attacking have to have 10 to 1 to overcome the defenders. That is so critical. And again, we, we don't know what's going to be the outcome in Kiev at this point. There are other elements, too, that are involved. And did your book look at the role of social media and what, what I'll say, for want of a better word, the use of educating the public or propaganda, however you want to look at it, either way. But it seems like social media which I know very little about, I'll be quite honest, but still, social media has played a key role in helping to mobilize the Ukrainians and to really instill an esprit de corps amongst people and to get information out to the outside world. If this were in 1944, this would not be the case. It would be a totally different type of war and as to how that war is communicated to the public. Did, did your book look into the to the methods of communication? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, totally agree with you. Uh, I mean, urban warfare is very interesting. I mean, 
propaganda, subversion, misinformation is a crucial part of all forms of warfare and always has been since antiquity. And it's true of conventional fighting in the field as it is on ur in urban warfare. But, but the urban environment is interesting because perforce, by necessity, it is a very civilianized domain. There are lots of civilians in the actual fight. The issue of information, propaganda, subversion, its importance is massively amplified. And I might suggest that in the 21st century, precisely as that balance between the military forces and civilians changes, and there's many more civilians in a city fought over than there are combatants, that's, that contrasts very strongly uh, with battles in the 20th century. In Stalingrad, by the height of the battle, uh, the Soviet and the German troops outnumbered the civilians who were left. Not the case in the 21st century. So issues of information, absolutely critical. And social media has become a very important source of information. One thing I'd say here, maybe, maybe we might want to talk a little bit more about this, is we need to be careful about exaggerating um, the, the sort of autonomous role of things like Facebook and Twitter. Um, what they do, and the evidence suggests is what they do is it's not that they mobilize, mislead people en masse. Uh, people aren't stupid, they aren't misled en masse. But what they do do is amplify existing social groupings and social divisions. And they effectively have a reinforcing effect and an amplifying effect on the urban um, on the urban demography and its divisions and it's also uh, it's the alliances between people. And you can see that very clearly in something like the, um, uh, uh, the, the Arab Spring, where, uh, in fact, football clubs and football hooligans played a key role in mobilising crowds facilitated by social media, but not determined uh, by social media. That, that, that is true. That's exactly how that developed is so critical. What about some of the other elements that we're dealing with? I know you're dealing with in the UK. There certainly are in Germany. We are in the United States with these elements of disinformation. In fact, we have news outlets in this country that uh, just put out so much misinformation and disinformation. They put out these QAnon conspiracies and different items like that. They're just so nonsensical and ridiculous. You wonder how intelligent people can believe what they're putting out. But how important are those elements and those types of activities by perhaps media sources, by, I won't say legitimate media sources, but folks or outlets that call themselves media outlets? Oh, well, I think they're very important. Um, and I think they're very important in a really profound way. So what, I, what we've talked about so far is the, the sort of uh, uh, the condensation, the concentration of the urban battle um, inside cities. But through the informational networks that you're talking about, uh, what we see in the urban battle of the 20th, 21st century is something really interesting. Um, the urban battles aren't isolated. They're not isolated in terms of their region, the nation, uh, as urban battles, as sieges were uh, in, in past history, even, even potentially in the 20th century. Uh, because of the informational connections between cities and crucially, diasporic, ethnic, or ethnically or politically aligned populations across the globe, uh, what we see is the interconnection of, of cities and uh, urban battles across an urban uh, global archipelago. And so, you know, even, even something like Kiev at the moment is very interesting in that what we can see resonating across that archipelago, that urban archipelago, are both accounts of the fighting from a Ukrainian and a Russian perspective. We can see subversion, propaganda, misinformation. Sometimes we can see the truth. But what's, what's, what's happening is that the actual combatants in a city are seeking to recruit, mobilise, address a diasporic, uh, diverse political audience across the globe uh, located in other cities. So, you know, even a city, uh, you know, I'm sat in, in the UK, uh, there's a large Ukrainian diasporic population in London that actually is being recruited by social media into the fight for Kyiv right now. And some of that, as you rightly say, is total misinformation. 
But it's not, but even things that are total lies, why are they believed? Because there is a truth at the heart of it, which is there is ethnic unity, groups of people politically aligned, ethnically aligned, racially aligned, religiously aligned, who, believe, who will believe messaging which affirms their group identity. And so this is th th this informational domain of the urban battle space is really, really important and points to a very, very complex geography, uh, which I think has emerged in the last 20 to 30 years. And it's interesting to see how even so many families are divided. There was a story yesterday that was on the air about a son who called his father who lived in Russia. And of course, Putin has been pushing the idea that he was de he was going to denazify Ukraine. That was his main motive for going in. And they were going in as peacekeepers and everything was going well. And they were helping people and providing humanitarian assistance. And his son said, no, the exact opposite is happening. And so you had quite a disparity between the information the son was getting as opposed to the indoctrination that the father was sure. getting. And it was, it was not a pleasant conversation, to put it mildly. But I'm sure that's happening in group after group, family after family, is, is it not? For, for, sure, for sure. And I mean, one of the things here is that it points out, I mean, here you've got, Ukraine is interesting in that it's an interstate war, but it's an interstate war that gets as close to a civil war as you're ever going to get an interstate war getting to because Ukraine was such an organic part of the, you know, the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. Um, so those kind of internal uh, divisions and fissures are, 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 are in, you know, profound interest and importance. What I'd also suggest is that, you know, in the 20th century, I mean, it, it is a simplification, but in the 20th century, power blocks tended to coalesce into quite simple binaries. You know, you were Soviet or you were Western, you were democratic, you were part of the US, uh, you were part of the US world or, or part of the Soviet world and aligned in that way. And, and there was a simplification. What we see now is, is something that I think is, would be much more familiar to someone, uh, a, 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 someone a, a, a medieval or early modern European, where the political allegiances are dispersed and distributed across a complex patchwork of polities and networks. And so exactly the kind of um, example that you're giving in terms of, you know, an internal Ukrainian dispute, you'll see the, I think you will start to see these, uh, uh, and you have seen some evidence of this already, but you will start to see some of this resonance going across the sort of, so there's a, in Europe, there's a Soviet network, Kaliningrad, Serbia, uh, the Republika Srpska, um, uh, they got links down into Syria. So we see a quite complicated network of political alliances, all implicated and all recruited into the battle, the upcoming battle of Kyiv uh, as, it, as it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, your book is so interesting and it's so timely and it's just spot on. Uh, in our last 30 seconds, what is the one main point, there are probably many, but one main point you'd like our viewers to take away from your book and from our conversation today? Well, we've become very modern, but somehow urban warfare takes us back to the horrors of antiquity. And I'm sorry to say we're about to see some horrific scenes in the next weeks as the Battle of Kiev and the battles of Kharkov uh, and other places start to intensify uh, in the coming war. These are words to live by. What we need to do is to avoid the war, <laughs> to start off with and not go to war. We have to use diplomacy. We need to use the United Nations, not a perfect institution, but still a place where you can negotiate and air your grievances and come together. But Professor Anthony King, thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for listening to me and thanks for asking me some questions. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.